Hi, I'm Dr. Willie Walter Jackson, Jr. I have a PhD in social work and I'm a professor here at Royal University. Today, I want to talk to you about an exciting new lecture series. The first of them being an introduction, an introduction to macro practice social work. The title of the book that we're going to be working with today is called Social Work Macro Practice. This is the sixth edition of the book. Um, the book's author is Ellen Netting. So you'll need that before you begin. But there are a couple of other things that you're going to need. Probably the most important thing that you'll need is some friends. Whether it's one friend or a few people, go ahead and find a few friends and make sure you have a time schedule before you start watching this video. The next thing you'll need is some materials to take notes. Whether that's pen, paper, a notebook, it's up to you. Some people like to write in the textbook and highlight things in the textbook, but the idea being is you want to have all your materials ready to go before we begin. So, take a moment, grab those materials, and come back. Go ahead and pause the video here. Hi, I want to talk to you about some of the theories that are driving this lecture series. I came across an exciting new teaching theory last year. It's called Small Teaching, and the author of this textbook is Lang. What I learned was, sometimes in teaching, you don't have to make massive changes to see big improvements. Sometimes it's just the small incremental changes along the way that help you make big improvements. Think of it sort of like playing baseball. Sometimes when you play small ball, it's the incremental hits, those base hits that you make along the way that win the game. It's not always the big crashing home runs. So that's what this is. We're gonna take a look at one video, see what can be improved, and see which direction we wanna go in. And then, with your feedback, will make those improvements and go in those directions. So at the end of this video, I'll be asking you for some feedback. To the far right, there is a pyramid that represents the type of learning that we can do. What we want to do is we want to spend most of our time applying the material, doing analyses, synthesizing the material, and evaluating the concepts within the material. So we're going to spend all of our time in small groups having those discussions. Okay, if you have everything you need, let's start the lecture. As I mentioned before, this is going to be the first chapter of the textbook, Macro Practice in Social Work. And one of the main questions that they ask is, Netting poses the question, what is macro practice? And her answer to that question is, she defines macro practice as professionally guided interventions that help bring about macro level change. However, we aren't going to stop there. I want you to tell me your definition of macro practice because chances are, if you've been in this program for a while, you already have some idea about what macro practice means. I also want you to think about what meso and micro level practice means. Pause this video for a moment, see if you can come up with your own definitions, and then we'll come back to the lecture. If your discussion went well, you talked a little bit about your understanding of macro level practice. However, one of the best ways to understand macro level practice is the upstream parable. There are many different versions of that story out there, so I'm going to share one of those versions of the story with you now. One day there's a social worker walking near a stream. As she's walking by the stream, she notices a basket floating down the stream. She hears crying emanating from the basket. So, 
Being the benevolent person that she is, she wades out into the stream, picks up the basket, and takes it ashore. When she looks in the basket, she notices there's a crying baby in the basket. To fix this problem, she adopts the baby as her own, takes the baby home, and raises her. A few months later, she returns to the stream. And lo and behold, this time, she notices two baskets floating down the stream. Again, being the good-hearted person that she is, she wades out into the river, grabs both of the baskets, and brings them ashore. It's at this point that she realizes that in her time away from the stream, perhaps she missed some baskets. So, she calls for help upstream and builds an organization. First, it's just a small, few, dedicated group of people that decide to keep an eye on the stream. But as time goes on, they build an elaborate agency around the stream and they set up netting and find different ways to fish baskets out and partner with organizations that can help with adopting babies out. They become very good at their jobs and it becomes very effective. But after a while, that social worker begins to have some questions. One of the primary questions is, where are all these babies coming from? It is at this point that she realizes she's going to have to go back upstream to ask some of the more difficult questions to get at the pathology. So, I'd like for you to have some discussion now. Many of the answers to these questions are in your textbook. So this will be a good place to pause and begin to think about note taking, right? Go through your textbook and just take notes and highlight things that might be interesting that help you answer all of these questions. However, as part of this lecture series, we're going to focus on one question. Why is direct practice not enough? I'll give you another example. This is a very simplified example, and it's just designed to help you understand why macro level practice is so important. It also is going to help you understand why we can't stay engaged and focused on micro level practice. Let's say you have a small industrial community. They make almost all of their money working in general labor, labor in industry. Let's say one of the companies decides it will dump its pollutants in the area. This creates a problem where the surrounding area becomes so toxic that many of the factories in the area have to close down and move out of that area. Shortly after that, people begin to go hungry, being that there's no work available. There's a slight spike in crime but nothing too serious. Someone decides to go upstream, that is to say, they decide to engage on a policy level to address this problem. And their approach to addressing the problem is to seek out stiffer fines and penalties. Meanwhile, industry is, continued to being, is continuing to be driven out of the area. There are some other policy options that we should consider here that might bring industry back into the area and resolve some of the crime. And this problem gets more at the pathology as opposed to the sympto symptomology, which is the crime. I want you to think about the example that I'm offering you and see what your group comes up with. Pause here and we'll return to the video in a moment. There are a few other things that we need to think about. Here are some more questions for your group to think about. How has policy impacted your daily practice? I think this is an important question because even if you aren't in social work practice, policy in some way has impacted you. I'd like for you to jot this question down and at the end of this segment, 
we're going to think about different ways that policy impacts your life already. Another important question for you to consider is the importance of the focus of the intervention in relationship to your roles. I created this chart right here based on what Netting was saying. She describes a focus of the intervention, but also looks at how that becomes an example of the level that you practice on and the role that you take on. Perhaps you can think of your own focus of intervention and your own roles. I would also challenge you to think about a meso-level role that perhaps isn't covered as much in this um, textbook. Now I would like for you to consider how social workers are drawn into macro practice. According to Netting, there are several avenues through which we can be drawn into social work practice. And all of those happen within a political and policy context. Let's look at the previous example, you know, the industrial pollution, pollution example. Let's say the social worker is drawn in through the problem. If the social worker is drawn in through a particular problem around, say, the victim, the social worker might make the mistake of seeking out stiffer penalties or fighting crime in some way. Not seeing the pathology, what's causing the problem, that is to say, the pollution. As social workers, we have to fully understand the context of the problem so that we don't make mistakes like this. I would like for you to take a moment, think about ways in which you're drawn into, the, into this practice. Is it through the problem, the population, or the arena? After you've discussed this, think about symptomology versus pathology and whether or not you're addressing symptoms or you're getting at the actual source of the problem. Welcome back. Again, I'd like for you to think about these questions. Many of the answers to these questions are in your textbook. However, we will spend some time answering one of these questions together. Why is terminology important to our profession? In order to answer this question, I want you to begin to think about your own personal experiences where you've used terminology that was best suited for your experience. However, I'm going to also draw from my experiences to offer you an example. I spent many years working in homelessness. During that time, we referred to people by their names. That is to say, we would never say that homeless guy over there, right? We'd say Bob came in last night and took a lunch with him. However, in cases where perhaps we didn't know the person's name, we would say a guest was here. That was softer terminology that we used. We would never say that homeless guy came over here or that homeless guy did that. That was just not becoming a professional behavior. When I'm writing, I refer to people as those experiencing homelessness. That is to say, even in my writing, in my professional writing, I would say, I would never say that homeless guy came in or that homeless guy this. I would say this person experiencing homelessness. This is important because it helps us remain professional, but also it's important because we don't label people, which is something that we're trying to prevent doing. Words have power. So, pause the video for a moment and think of some other names that we use to describe people. Terminology is really important, so it's a good idea to spend some time here.
NASW has laid out a code of ethics for us. Many of our values come from this code of ethics. It would be a good idea for you to begin thinking about how our code of ethics impacts macro level practice. In some respects, our code of ethics even dictates what we do on a policy level. If there's something you can, you're confused about, for example, say, pro-life versus pro-choice, you can review what NASW has put out about that decision, and you'll probably get a good understanding of the professional direction that we need to take. Let's talk about one example, though, social justice. Imagine you work at an agency that provides a critical service for people in the community. Your agency dictates the cost of that service. Now, let's say that service is only affordable to those from a middle to upper socioeconomic uh, income status. If that is the case, how are you correcting a social injustice? See, this creates an ethical conflict because as a social worker, you're beholden to the policies of the organization. So it's very hard to begin giving services to those who perhaps can't afford those services. There are many dilemmas that surface throughout a social worker's career, and this is but one. Pause this video and take a moment to discuss some possible dilemmas. See if you can find some of the answers out there that NASW has supported or published on. Thank you very much for reviewing this video with your friends. I hope you had some very insightful conversations along the way. When you're finished, please go into the course and provide some feedback. Your feedback is very important to me as it can help me improve the video as I go and it can also tell us which areas we need to dive into next. Have a wonderful day.